one record and we're live yes are we live on the air we're, we're on the airwaves oh do we stream these no oh okay we, i mean we so basically really do live we don't edit so we're basically yeah, yeah. it's the same thing it's like streaming after the fact yeah it's like um post hoc streaming mm-hmm. yeah man we should stream these fuck it yeah, i don't see why not it might actually be easier so yeah. i don't i mean i, I don't know so I don't have to save the files and do all the stuff. And mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll look into it. Will we? I will, yeah. Well, that's how I have to do it over there because I forgot to bring my laptop. So all I can do is stream. And then on YouTube, you know, there's like different folders. One of them is like videos, which is where ours go. They mm-hmm. go into our videos folder. Yep. And then there's a live folder. And if I record one, it goes straight to the live folder. That's Lots of people do it that way. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I would like to see you. I like to see what kind of material you would put out that's on your prob- own. That's the problem I'm having is I don't really know what I want to do. Like I, I'm wrestling between like, yeah, just what kind what I want the content to be. You yeah. know, I don't really I mean my, I can guarantee you that my pod is solo going to be intellectual is your stuff. Uh, but where it lands in there. See, I, I, my advice to you would be to find something that's genuinely interesting to you and just talk about that, man. Yeah. Because if you're interested in it, it'll come through, it'll come through to the audience and getting really interested in like Plato, like yeah. how they put together Plato. No, I'm just joking. Oh, I thought you meant no. Plato, Pl- P-L-A-T-O. Oh, Plato. Yeah, I was no, getting I'm ready definitely to be into not that. interested in Plato. Like, oh. You know, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I'm more of an Aristotle guy. I know you're not. I know you're like firmly in Camp Plato. I'm firmly in Camp Plato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do appreciate I do appreciate Aristotle. Yeah. I think Aristotle's a bridge between the mystical people and the scientific people. Yeah. Because Aristotle's teacher was mystical, Plato. And Aristotle's the father of empirical science. So he's like the bridge. He is the bridge. This is the way. I'm not even really uh, that much of an Aristotle guy. I just said that because I know that you are firmly in Camp Plato. <laughs> what makes you say that? <laughs> um, I've just heard you talk about Plato, yeah, and I know that you, I know like where your philosophical inclinations lead, and it's definitely more Plato stuff than it is Aristotle stuff. I, I've probably said this before, but there's a famous painting by Raphael. It's called The School of Athens, mm-hmm. and it's just like this um, classical building, ancient Greek building, pillars and like marble floor, and, and the, this building is full of philosophers from all different times so it's like you know if we had a time machine and we can get all the greatest philosophers together this is what it would look like and it was um you know all the great greek philosophers some of them from the middle east uh you know you can see like there's a couple of them that are wearing turbans and things like that yeah but right in the middle right right where your eyes are drawn right in the middle is um a young man walking arm in arm with an old man it's plato and socrates it's it's Plato it's Plato and Aristotle. Oh, Plato and Aristotle. And Plato is pointing up. Uh huh. And Aristotle is pointing down. Yeah. And that's basically all you need to know about the difference between Plato and Aristotle. Plato was about the world of forms, about a reality greater than ours, and he's pointing up to heaven, like there's something important up here. And Aristotle is pointing down to the earth and saying. No, bitch. Everything, everything that's important is right here under our feet. You know, the material here and now. And that's really all you need to know. If you if you can know that about Plato and Aristotle, you get it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a nice little. Uh, I don't know what you would call that that type of literary device. Yeah. A syllogism. I don't think it's a syllogism. No. I, I couldn't. Like I couldn't word. define that word. The syllogism. I did hear Bo Burnham work it into a rap once, and that was pretty cool. Bo Burnham. I like that guy. He's pretty funny. I do like Bo Burnham. Uh, yeah. There's also a song that comes to mind. Uh, by a band called Anatomy of a Ghost, and they worked the word superlunary into one of their songs, and I thought that was pretty epic. One of you, superlunary. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever even heard that word. The lyric is suspended in the superlunary, that just means the space between the earth and the moon. And that's your vocabulary lesson for today on the Two Tongues podcast. Superlunary, superlunary. All right, speaking of. Lunatics. I want to tell you what happened to me yesterday. Oh, got an encounter with a lunatic? Yeah, I live with one. 
So, Got all it. right. So, okay. So I don't know. Like I never really talked about this on the podcast much and I don't want to get too specific. Just, you know, uh, just out of common courtesy. Yeah. Just out of common courtesy. Um, but, uh, my wife's aunt and uncle live with us and they're, uh, you know, they've been helping babysit and they've been really important in the family for years. And, uh, but the problem is that, um, her uncle's got, you know, his share of problems like everybody has. And one of those problems is alcoholism. And uh, we just see him little by little shifting more towards um, valuing that over everything else, just your typical addict type of behavior. But I have never really seen such severe addiction from alcohol. Like I've seen people have this level of severe addiction to opiates. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. I've never seen this level of addiction to alcohol. Uh, it's like beyond what I saw from my parents or what I saw from anybody growing up. Um, anyway, uh, he's also an, he's also an older fella. And, and uh, you know, as you get older, you start to give less of a shit. True. So it's like a, it's a perfect storm combination of him just wanting to get fucked up more than anything in the world, more than more than living here, more than having a relationship with with this family or you know, my kids. Uh, and it wasn't always like that. So it's like, it wasn't always like that, man. That means at some point he decided, you know what, after spending a lot of time with his family and enjoying these kids and all that, I still really think I'd rather get fucked up. So he, you know, he's picking that over all of this. Um, so anyway, it's just been a point of contention and there's been lots of, uh, uh, stress in the house about it for like, like an extended oh, period I, of time. I, I remember hearing about it for a long time. It's been a thing. Mm. And then like every now and then something will happen, which will blow it up. So like one day he uh, decided in the summer, he was going to take the bike out of the garage and take a little trip, just a little joy, just a joy ride around, not just on our like street. A bike sickle? Bicycle. Yeah. Okay. So you got a 70 year old man on a bicycle. Fucking Schwinn. <laughs> he shows back up at the house a couple minutes later. His head is busted open. He's bleeding. And he, you know, he's belligerent and you know, uh. <laughs> And then on another occasion, he fell into the fire. We had a, f a fire, you know, just sitting around the fire. And this, this motherfucker fell into it on one occasion. So here's the thing. It's like my wife doesn't want the kids to be exposed to that unnecessarily. And I have a hard time blaming her. Yeah. They shouldn't have to see that. I shouldn't be in a position to have to explain that mm -hmm. to a little child, you know? So anyway, um, he has this habit of uh, going out for whatever excuse he can he can bring up to go out so he'll like, get in the fuck out of here yeah, he's like i gotta go to costco yeah. you know it's like okay see you and he'll stay out all day long all day long he comes home at four o'clock 4 p.m it doesn't matter if he leaves at 10 o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon he's gonna be home at 4 p.m and he's gonna be drunk oh and uh and everybody tells him you know because he's oh, he's he, as an addict one of the things he does is hides it all Constantly lying, mm -hmm. hiding constantly, even when everybody knows already and you're not fooling anybody. He cannot help himself. He hides beer in the oven. He hides beer in the, in the container where the dog food is kept in the garage. He hides beer. He hides it. He put, he like go empty beer cans or that's where he's hiding his stash. That's like, that's where he hides his stash. Okay. On occasion though, you'll find like a bottle of beer in the oven where somebody came in too quick and he fucking stuck it in there. Yeah. That kind of, it's just maddening. It's maddening because it, because it, because it plays everybody for a fool and it doesn't do him any good. And I, nobody understands why he insists on making everyone else out to be a fool while he continues to behave like this. I just wish he would, he would do it in the open and he, he won't. So he doesn't drink in front of you guys at all. Not really. Yeah. No. He, so mostly he stays in his room and, and does it, but here's the thing is like, we never know. Because what he'll do is he'll go to the liquor store and get his whatever he's going to drink. Then he'll stash it in whatever compartment in his car. He, he doesn't think anybody would look. Mm. So it's like in there where the spare tire is. Mm -hmm. And no one really knows if he's drinking like in the parking lot at the, at the liquor store yeah. or if he's coming home and drinking in the, in the driveway and then coming in. Nobody knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, but when he comes home at 4 o'clock – you know, he's, he's doing his best to pretend that he's not drunk and it's super obvious to everybody. And, uh, it's not like, you know, some days are worse than others, I guess. But what I mean to say is that he's, he's, he's likely from time to time driving when he shouldn't be driving. Mm 
and his and his wife in particular continues to tell him like whatever you're gonna do don't do that just wait till you get home don't do that but this motherfucker cannot help himself he doesn't want to be seen so anyway what happened uh, this this weekend was uh he left to go do laundry he was mad at mad at me because he does interesting things with the with the washing machine, like stops it in the middle of a cycle, runs an extra drain cycle, takes part of the clothes out of the washer, run, finishes the cycle. What? You wouldn't believe it. That's that's I, weird. I can't tell you how many times I've come downstairs and there's so, a soaking wet pile of socks on top of the washer while the rest of the wash is going. And so, well, we got a new machine and we're like, stop fucking don't do it. stuff like that like yeah. all this stuff super automated there's all these new cycles on there now what what are you doing you're gonna break something man and uh but anyway you can't tell him anything like that without him getting extremely offended mm. you can't tell him anything that even borders on critical or he shuts down and becomes you know belligerent sober even same way yeah he's an impossible man to deal with so anyway i bring this up to him and i'm like hey man i told you not to do that uh, you know we noticed that the washer was like stuck in a drain cycle and we had to reset the thing to get it to work again and he's like how do you know it was me immediately <laughs> deflecting 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 always yeah. like a child it's disgusting and it's very sad and uh anyway this, this, that was his excuse this time he's like i'm gonna do my laundry at the laundry mat yeah. so out of bitterness like i give a shit he he takes his laundry to the laundry mat that was his excuse to get yeah. out of the house and be gone all day to do whatever he wants to do mm -hmm. and so I didn't see him uh, until 3.30. I saw him pull in the driveway. And then he sits there for a minute. And then his car's gone. After uh, yeah, Next time I look, his car's gone. I don't know what happened. My rationalization is he noticed he, it was, he was home before 4 o'clock so and decided, got a half hour, I got to go, get back out there. Right. So then I go and I pick, uh, pick up uh, my oldest daughter from the bus stop. And on the way home, I stop at the neighbor's house. And she's playing with, uh, with his son in the front yard. And they're running around playing. And uh, here comes Paul comes comes down the street and when he turns onto our road he takes this ridiculous wide turn and ends up in the neighbor's yard a little bit and i'm like oh this isn't good here we go <laughs> then he stops right in front of the neighbor's house where i where i'm playing in the front yard which i thought he he saw me and he was going to say something to me i don't know but he wasn't he just wanted to stop in the middle of the road so he could finish eating his mcdonald's before he pulled into back into our house like he he even wants to hide that he went and got McDonald's because we cook dinner for him every night and the, and on, on you know at his whim he'll decide when he wants to have dinner on his own and not eat with us and he doesn't tell us we continue to cook for him he just is that completely self-centered so here he is sitting in the middle of my road eating his fucking cheeseburger and I'm staring at him I'm like 20 feet from him looking at him he's oblivious to the fact that we can see it then he pulls in uh, after he finishes his burger he pulls into the driveway and not five minutes later a cop turns on our street pulls real slow right up to my house and pulls up right behind right behind his car and i'm like i guess i gotta go so i take my daughter by the hand walk across the street past the police car here comes another cruiser and so another cruiser when you saw this were you thinking did you immediately know that that's, or were you thinking they're going to go, they're going to a different house or, or did you just like instinctively know? Um, well, when he took that super wide turn, yeah, something's I, up. I knew something was up. And then when I saw the cop, I immediately put two and two together. Um, and I was immediately on my radar. Like, the, Oh, this, this is probably for him. There's a, I live on a dead end street. There's only a handful of houses here and they've yeah. never come down the street. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, probably, you know, there ends up being four cruisers out in front of our house while the police are talking to him. And I walk right past the police, just give him a little wave with my daughter, walked right into the house. And she didn't, she didn't ask me any questions really, which I thought was, was interesting, but, but here I am in this position to have to explain to, you know, a six year old kid what's going on here. Yeah. Like I'm a fucking white trash, uh, you know, dude in a trailer park having a domestic dispute. That's the, that, that's the picture here and fucking suburbia. And I have to explain to my child, I'm trying to protect her from that world at this point in her life. And um turns out that when he went to McDonald's, he, he bumped into some other car. Um, that doesn't surprise me really. And it's dangerous and it could have been worse. Easy to all do when that. you're sober. So yeah, yeah, if you're, you know, 
and I don't know the details. I wasn't there, but from what like a little bit he I I could, heard from him, he said that he was arguing with the person who he bumped into. Oh, and telling him that you know I didn't hit you. That damage was already there. Oh. You know, blah 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 blah, and uh, they got heated. And then he, and then at some point he tells, he asks the person who he hit to see their green card. <laughs> their green He's like, card. you know what? Why don't you show me? Mexican. Why don't you show me your green card? Well, I don't, I don't know if he was Mexican, but he was probably wasn't white or black. He was probably something else. Okay. And he, and this person is an old man, you know, who was drunk and you know, whatever. And he's very. Uh, I just hesitate because all, all I have is negative things to say at this point. But um, that pissed the guy off enough where he was like, okay, I'll write down your, your uh, plates and I'm going to call the fucking police. And that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly why they came right to my house and they did a sobriety test on him and they put him in handcuffs and they took him away and, uh, you know, all of that. Then I get a call like an hour later from the police department. It's a small suburb, suburb you know, and he's, they're like, can you come get him? And I'm like, listen. I don't know how this works. Do I have to pay money to get him out? Cause I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, he was like, no, it's like, there's a bond, but you know, you don't have to bring any money and he has to come to his court date and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I'm like, what if I just don't come get him? Because I, cause I have a mind to let him fucking suffer a bit, you know, and he won't learn the lesson. He hasn't learned the lesson mm -hmm. just the way he's acted yesterday. And today he hasn't learned the lesson. He's me. I'm the one time about the washing machine. Uh, I'm the one that made him so mad. He decided to go to the laundromat and uh, everything that happened as a consequence is because I upset him. He drank and drove because of me. Mm -hmm. He hit a guy and said some racist shit because of me. You know, he got arrested because of me. Um, so anyway, it was just an interesting day. That's, that's definitely some some shit to deal with. I feel really, really. What happened? Did you go get him? I went and got him yeah. uh, because the, because when I asked the cop, I said, what happens if I just don't come get him? And the cop was like, I'll, I'll bring him home. I'll, bring, uh -oh. I'll drop him okay. off. And he was like, but it's Friday night and we really need to be out there patrolling. And I'm like, give me a fucking break. That's, first what, that's, of all. that's what he said. I was like, I was like, <laughs> okay. Don't, I was like, no, like, no. I'm not going to out what city you're in, but not, it's not like crime central. No, you no, know? no, no. Shit's not going down. But I also feel like all of this was an inconvenience for the for the police. All of this was yeah. an inconvenience for everybody, and it's sure. only, it's only his fault. And it's in you know the police shouldn't. Have. So when I went and got him. It's not it wasn't a far drive. Yeah, yeah. So I went and got him, and uh, he said thanks. He said thanks immediately when uh, I picked him up, and he was still drunk, and uh, uh, he almost fell getting into the car and all that. And uh, by the time we were a mile down the road, he was yelling at me. Nobody else in my house was even going to pick him up mm -hmm. because he, he, he needs to learn a lesson, you know, and he won't, he's not going to learn the lesson. Yeah. So we've been, uh, you know, we've had, we've had our fair share of, uh, frustrations and like I said, blow ups that have happened over the course of the last several years. And there's been times where my wife's been at wit's end about it and I can't blame her, you know, and there's been times where I thought I was going to have to pick between having my wife and my family in this house and trying to be nice and allowing this, you know, selfish man child to continue to, to exist off the coffers of the, my good graces, you know, mm -hmm. that's how I feel, unfortunately. Um, but I feel most bad for his wife because she's been with him for 50 fucking years. And because he's putting her in this terrible situation where she basically now has to choose between him and the only family she has left and the kids that she's been raising like her own grandkids. It's a terrible choice to have to make. Yeah. And I have no doubt the choice she makes isn't going to make him happy, but it's going to make him awful sad, awful lonely, and it's going to make her the same. And, uh, you know, it's a terrible position that his selfishness has put this whole fucking family in. Yeah. Uh, so he's got to go. He can't stay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know at what, at what point that the, you know, that, that's going to drop, but he, he can't stay. He's got to go and she's got to make that terrible choice. And it's all his fault and it's a disaster. Yeah. Could be worse, but yeah, it could have been worse, but it's still pretty bad. It's not, not an ideal situation. I, uh, I'll say this. Um, I totally 100% understand your guys' situation, but I do, I have love for the guy and I'm sure you do too, you know, but, um, 
he is obviously like part of him is a, a good hearted, nice person. Um, and then other times, you know, I, I don't see this as much as you yeah. do. So it's, um, but you know, when he's, you know, he's a, he's a nice enough guy when he's not in his cups, you know? Yeah. I, um, I don't think he wishes harm on anybody. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you there. Um, and another reason that I have, uh, you know, some sympathy is that I feel like it's you know there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, like I've made, a, I've done a lot of stupid things. Um, and I've continued to do lots of stupid things that I knew were stupid, you know, just because I'm stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I just, uh, I feel bad on some level, you know, but I do too. Yeah, I know. It's like, but it, I, I can't, I see no fault in on your side of it. You know, obviously yeah. it's like, you know. Well, I mean, so my parents and my wife's parents both had periods of time where they were drinking pretty heavily when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. And we, we both have some handful of sort of traumatic memories that stick around with us. Memories that we do not want to, we specifically want to avoid creating those memories for our kids. Yeah. And this is a, is it? Ever For present, sure. it's an ever present danger. His presence is an ever present danger of that happening. Yeah, I mean, it's the only person that it's going to be coming from, you know. And you're right. You're right about him. As far as, like I said, as far as he, you know, he he wouldn't intentionally hurt anybody. I don't yeah. think. Um, and you know, he's had a share, fair share of problems like everybody else. You know, they are contributing factors. They aren't excuses. Nope. Um, but the other the thing about him that I've learned over the last several years is that he's a nice enough guy, but doesn't has never done a thing that he didn't think was going to benefit him. I'm not saying that doesn't mean he hasn't done nice things, but he, he own he only and ever does them. If he thinks it, 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 you know, it's going to get him what he wants or, you know, be enjoyable for him. Yeah. I definitely know that kind of person. And, you know, like I said, I don't, all I ever see of the guy is when I come over here for a few minutes, you know, I, it's not like I've hung out with him. So obviously you see the bigger picture than I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's one other thing I want to bring up here and that is that, so one I, I learned from Jordan Peterson, something real that's really been helpful to me in my life. And that is that women, oh, JP, that women on average feel negative emotion more intensely than men do. And that's one of these, sexist things people could say that i'm making an arbitrary division between men and women but statistically when they do these personality tests of which jordan is an expert mm -hmm. um they see that women by and large um experience negative emotion more acutely than men and his explanation for that is well women are are designed biologically to deal with an infant that is completely dependent on it on her so if she has to be moved to action immediately when the baby needs something because otherwise the baby will die it's completely dependent on you so a woman more than a man has to be sensitive to that they have to hear the cry you know from a from a distance they have to they have to intuit all kinds of things they have to be on it because the baby is entirely dependent on them and i get that i understand that so that when i have experiences with uh my wife let's say uh, that i feel are like unreasonable like a lot of times guys will be like you know when dealing with this sort of, you know, uh, romantics, you know, difficulties or whatever, will often find they don't understand the woman's perspective. You know, yeah. it seems unreasonable. You're like, you know, why does that make you so mad? Like, why are you focusing on that little detail? Because they have to, because that's how they're designed psychologically. It doesn't just go away when they're done having kids. They're just going to be like that forever. And so, you know, there's going to be things that that are going to you have to deal with as a consequence. Um, the reason I bring that up in this context is because I wonder to what extent some people, you know, some people are more powerfully impacted by addiction or chemicals. Right? Everybody's bodies are different, and I wonder is this one of those situations where I simply cannot understand? It's like the gulf between me and my wife when it comes to <laughs> negative emotion. I cannot put myself in that position. It's like, um, as an example, I can ignore the kids whining and crying. I can sort of, I hear it, but I sort of block it out um, when I'm doing something. She cannot do that. 
She, she literally cannot do that. If she's working and she hears it, all of her attention, all of it, she can't block it out. It immediately takes her off, off course and she goes to, to do that. And I understand that now. And I wonder if there's some parallel there where some people are so sensitive to chemicals and so sensitive to that addic addictive personality that I'm failing to be sufficiently, um, what's the word, uh, empathetic. What do you think? Um, I think that maybe there's some truth in that, but I also don't know like what you're supposed to do, you know, like just because that may be the truth, you know, uh, like if society operated that way, we'd just be like the, letting people use that as an excuse to get away with whatever they wanted. You know, it's just like not you, you just can't do it. Yeah. You know, I think you have a responsibility to conquer yourself. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I mean. Um, that's what being grown up is all about. That's what maturity is. It's it's being greater, being in charge of all of the impulses that when you were a kid ran amok. You couldn't control them. So you you build up that super ego or whatever it is that can control everything underneath it in the hierarchy so that when you get angry, you don't fucking blow up and throw a fit and kick and scream and punch people. When you get horny, you don't, you know pull it out and start jerking off in the grocery store or whatever in the back pew at church, you know, you have control over yourself. Yeah. You have a responsibility to do, to do that. That's what being an adult is. Now I don't see him as an adult, nearly 80 years old, still a child. And I don't know if I'm being too harsh. Some people don't ever, don't ever develop sufficient control over themselves. They don't ever get that, you know, that I don't know, man. S some people don't, ever develop sufficient control of themselves. Uh, but a lot of people, if they don't, it's in ways that are like, maybe annoying, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you don't, I was gonna say, maybe you don't want it around you. And that's exactly the position that you're in. But I was thinking of like, more benign things, you know. Um, but you know, drinking and driving. It's pretty serious having the cop show up to your house. That's pretty serious. And it you know. could have been way worse. Oh, yeah. I you mean, know. You know, I I actually don't have the animosity towards cops that I once had. I still am not like a fan of modern day policing. But anytime the cops show up to your house, things can go bad. You yeah. know, uh, so you know, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't want them showing up to my house for some stupid ass reason either. Yeah. So the other interesting detail about this story, so I didn't see it, but my my wife said that uh, he he started getting animated with the cops, like he was yelling at him and waving his hands around. And when the cops came and knocked on the door after they put him in handcuffs, put him in the car, they were telling me like what to expect. Um, and all of the police, and there was a bunch of them there, all of them were like apologizing. They were all all apologies about it. Yeah. They said to me, "We don't we don't want to have to give this uh, give an, you know an old man a hard time. We're not here to to do yeah. that." And uh, I imagine, and you know, fine, fair enough. I imagine that he, I didn't hear. Obviously, I was I was not part of that. I just went inside and I didn't hear it, but I imagine what he said. I imagine he said, you know, I'm a 75 year old man and I, I was in Vietnam and you know, you guys are, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and he pulled on their, on their police heartstrings and made them feel like they were the assholes, you know? Yeah. And that's such a manipulation. Like I understand people would do whatever they can to try to get out of trouble or whatever they can to try to, uh, but that's, it's not honorable. You have to take responsibility for your own shit, you know? Yep. And this this man does not take responsibility for his own shit. Not once, not ever. I've never seen it from him. Yeah. So now I'm ranting. I, I didn't really want to do that. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because it's like, how I don't understand how it's possible that somebody can get to his age and still be like this. Mm -hmm. And I don't like I, I, it makes me wonder, was he always like this? Is this something that's happening with age? Am I going to have to deal with this one day? Um, he has absolutely no ability to to own up to his to his shit. You know, he even oh man, see, now I'm bitching. <laughs> I was going to say that he even will blame his mother. To this day, he'll blame his mother for the things that he does. Yeah, she's dead, man. Some people really, I, I, I think earlier in my life, I had some of that. And, and, and I mean, our parents do contribute to the things that haunt us going forward in life. But at a certain point, it's not 
she can't do it. I mean, especially if she's dead, she can't do anything about it, you know? So it's on you. You got to fix it. You got to, so, yeah. you have to notice it in yourself and fix it. Um, so if it's possible for people to like, I don't know, like, I guess I'll put it this way. You know, we, we had this talk about a lot about how social pressure um, works a lot better often than laws to mm -hmm. control behavior. We don't have to have laws for everything. We don't have to have laws for politeness. People just are polite because if they're not, no one's going to want to play in the playground with you. You're a dickhead, you yeah. know? Um, so that works by like you act in the world and the society, the people around you respond to your actions. And based upon how they respond, you tailor your behavior to, to get along or to please others or to, you know, get by. You tailor your behavior based on the, re the response you're getting, and that's how you navigate the world. That's how you figure out what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, how you figure out what social norms are. People are responding to you, and this guy has that feedback, valuable feedback that he gets from the world every single day, and by that I mean nobody talks to him. He doesn't have any friends. He's been divorced several times. You know, his wife doesn't sleep in the same bed with him. Like you're getting signals all over the place, as strong as you can imagine, social signals that are telling you you're doing something wrong. Like everything you're doing is wrong. You have to do something else so that you'll get a different response. And it's like running into a brick wall. He cannot, he will not, he refuses to see any of this feedback as anything other than people picking on him. Mm. The cops are picking on him. Everybody's everybody's out for, you know, it's like, how can you for years? Zero. Nobody around you cares about you. You know, God, that's such a hard thing to say. It's the truth. How do you get to that point? How do you let yourself get to that point and not want to do anything to recover from that? You know? Yeah. Sounds very like a very alienated life, you know, you're just, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know how somebody commits to that, you know, without trying to, like you said, want to do something different. I, I the fact that it's possible for humanity, which means it's possible for you and me and everyone listening to have made those choices and to have be in the position that he's in, that's possible. And it's baffling to me. Because I cannot imagine it as possible for me. Cannot imagine it. Is there anything, though, that like, you know, he's got his thing with alcohol. Everyone's got their. Well, I, I don't really know that that's the truth. I think some people. Some people just don't have. No, I, I don't think that's true. I think everybody does have something that they're kind of like drawn to and they have a hard time letting go of. But for some people, those things are like inherently more destructive than other things. You know what I mean? Yep. Some things destroy a lot more quickly than other things too. So, yeah. Um, but yeah. So have you had something in your life that like, you just can't let it go? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, like try to think about it in that kind of a context, you know? Yeah. But then I get into this situation where I still, struggle to empathize because because I have things that that I need to um, get more disciplined about pleasures things that I like that I would be better off if I didn't allow myself to indulge in mm -hmm. food is one of them as an example yeah and um, I know that and I beat myself up about it and I still go and you know often act the same way that I know I shouldn't so I get that but by and large, I, I'm still fighting that fight, right? But I'm winning it more than I'm losing it. And I'm still trying. So if you see somebody out there who doesn't know, who no longer tries, who surrenders to that, it's deeply, deeply pathetic. And it's deeply sad. And I, I, I know what you mean. It's almost like if you, if you give in to that, you've given up on life. Yeah. I, I, I'm somebody who has my things that I struggle with for sure. Um, and I give into them, you know, um, but 
I don't know. At a certain point, it is like you get to a point where you're like, this thing is destroying my life, you know? Uh, so I don't know. It's still hard to let it go. It sure is. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. I guess some people just don't respond to that stimulus as well. You know, that's yeah. just, I, I don't know. I guess it's not a motivating factor for them. So Jordan Peterson brings up the Cain and Abel story with this because the basically the message is that that uh, Abel was making worthy sacrifices mm -hmm. and Cain wasn't. And it's, it's not clear in the story what they were sacrificing or why God wasn't smiling at Cain like he was with Abel. But both brothers were sacrificing and one brother's sacrifices were acceptable and one's weren't. And it made the it made the other made Cain bitter and enough to where he kill, ends up killing his brother, and Jordan says that we all know we all know what this story is about, even though they don't they don't they don't specify what these sacrifices are. And literally, they were like sacrifices to God, like you would sacrifice an animal or or whatever first fruit offerings or whatever. Um, and and Jordan says, uh, imagine a time in your life when you were trying to you know give up one of the, one of these pleasures when you were trying to conquer something that you knew was, was no good. You sacrifice the pleasure. You, you sacrifice that. That's the right sacrifice. You know that because you don't want to sacrifice. You don't want to let it go. You want, you want to keep it so bad, but you, you offer that sacrifice up and God smiles on you. But if you do, like, I'll give, I'll give you an example about me. Um, you know, I used to, uh, we, we talked about this a little, little while ago. We both used to be a lot fatter, Right. And we've gone up and down and we've worked hard and struggled and fucked up all, over and over again. And there was times where I looked a lot better. I was a lot more healthy. And I, and I know I could get back to that. And I know I need to get back to that. And one of the things that's difficult is uh, alcohol, you know, especially during COVID. And ever since then, I've been a much, much more of a fan of the of the sauce than I used to be. Yeah. And I struggle with that. And I know I need to give that up. And, um, you know, all, along with other di dietary things that I need to change. Yeah. And what happens is I'll tell myself, like, you shouldn't be eating the carbs. You shouldn't be drinking the beer. You know that. Those are the easy, low-hanging fruit. Get rid of them. And uh, and I struggle with that. Why do you think you struggle with it? Like, hold, what? Hold, hold on. Let me right. let me finish this, this thought. Um, what I'll do is I'll negotiate with myself. So this isn't going to be unfamiliar. You're going to know exactly what I mean. I'll say to myself, I know I shouldn't be drinking alcohol, period spikes your blood sugar. It makes it very difficult to lose weight, even in low quantities, all that stuff. I know that, but I tell myself just on the weekends, you'd be good during the week, but on the weekends, oh, yeah. give yourself a break. You can have a little on the weekends. See, not a good sacrifice. It's a fake sacrifice. It's a half-ass sacrifice. Like Jesus said, see, you're neither, neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. So I'll spit you from my mouth. You remember when he said that? I do. Yeah. That, that's how I'm being to myself. Yeah. Then I say, then I say to myself, beer makes you bloated. Beer's got the carbs in it. The wheat, you know, beer's, beer's the really bourbon. the problem. Yeah. So have a cocktail instead or, or have a, have one of my hard kombuchas. They got probiotics in them, Kyle. So they're good for you. Yeah, they're yeah. good it's for you. They like doing pushups. Right? Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's just like doing pushups. Yeah. So then I, so, you can see I'm not making the right sacrifice, mm -hmm. even though I know what the right sacrifice is. I'm conning myself into thinking. Let me ask you something. Yes, we're basically brothers, and I've been I've been doing pretty good with keto over the last month. Have you had an instinct to kill me? <laughs> no, no. Okay, that's good. <laughs> just checking, just checking. You know, I not even a little. I'm making a good sacrifice, although I took a day off keto. Oh, you did, and it's. I feel, I, I wish I wouldn't, yep. I wish I wouldn't have. Always know? feel that way. I just, I was just, and I was like one day, well, you know, and then I'm right back to it. And, and nothing that I even ate was even that enjoyable. Exactly. It was like, why did I do this? Yep. My stomach hurts. Yep. It's fucking stupid, man. hundred percent. But if you let yourself do it for two days or three days. Oh, you're off the train. Next thing you know. You're yeah. Fucking, you're like, God damn, this is delicious. all that weight back. Yeah. Your clothes are fitting tight again. Yep. That's where I am right now, man. Um, so anyway, um, where were we at the, making the right sacrifices? So um, I don't know where I was coming around to this, but I, obviously uh, he he's continuing to do what I just said, admitted to doing. He's yeah. not he's not making the right sacrifices. He just was something way more, yeah, you know, destructive. Yeah, he can't even see what the right sacrifice is. It's not even an option on the table for him. He doesn't see it even. Yeah. Um, but let me ask you a question about this this scenario. Something about the person, like we don't have to talk about this guy in particular, like specifically anymore. Let's 
just talk about this type of person. One that is uh, not, doesn't shoulder responsibility, doesn't take, you know, responsibility for their actions, acts in a lot of way like a child. Um, and as a result, they become selfish and a drain on the people that support them, their family and friends and all that. Something about that. It's not the worst kind of person you can imagine. There are worse kinds of people. For sure. But something about that makes me want to describe that personality type as evil. Evil like a murderer, evil like a thief, evil like a, you know, a dark-hearted person that doesn't care about anybody but themselves and does worse things, even though he's just doing it to himself, you know, and everybody else is just cannon fodder. Everyone else is just, you know, um, the, un un the unfortunate consequence of, of you know, what his behavior. Um, something about that makes me put that personality type in the same category as all the other antisocial types of personalities that result in worse results. Like I want to call it evil. What do you think? Um, I don't, well, I, I, I have a little, I don't know. I have some resistance to calling it evil for some reason. Um, I do too, but that's why I'm asking. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I, I see what you're saying and I do think that, that kind of antisocial behavior. What am I trying to say here? I think that any kind of antisocial behavior from a person, a lot of the times has the ability to manifest into like more concerning antisocial behavior. You know what sure. I mean? If you're doing something that's like antisocial, but it's, it's just like kind of weird. Uh, a lot of those people have the capability to get, worse you know um so i i think that there's something to that you know i think that if you see some i mean i have some antisocial personality things so um you know i just think that if you see somebody acting on those things like frequently yeah maybe that's like someone you should keep an eye on you know or somebody who like leans into it even if it's not like that big of a deal you know right. what i mean I, I i as i'm thinking it through i think what where it might stem from when I say evil is this idea that uh, as a member of society, you participate in something bigger than yourself as an individual. You participate in society and you contribute to society. You get things and you give things. And that's all part of the contract. It's like, if you want to live in a society, you're going to have things like roads and easy access to food and, you know, easy access to other human beings for services and, and companionship. And, you know, you get all these great perks about participating in society. But what you, but what you have to pay is restricting your behavior in certain ways, working and paying taxes and, you know, all that stuff. You have you're going to get a lot and you're going to give a lot. And then there are people that refuse to give. There are people like leeches that want to, um, that want to enjoy the benefits of society without paying the cost. And, you know, there's a whole broader conversation there about, you know, welfare and all kinds of other things that we could talk about. But, um, you know, people that are on unemployment and disability and, you, you know, all this stuff, even though they're perfectly healthy and, you know, just working the system like con men. And I see somebody like him, like, like that, because he's not doing anything to help. He's not contributing anything. Um, that's the evil part. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're taking and not giving and we're all supposed to be working together as kind of like one big master organism. And so every individual cell in that body, he being one of them, you and I being one of them, who isn't participating in the system is something like a cancer in the system. You're taking, 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 and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's, that sounds like evil to me, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't – I would like to know – the theological definition of evil. Um, what, what, what does it mean? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, like I have my interpretation of, you know, like I, if somebody asked me, what is the definition of evil? I don't even know what I would say. Um, but 
I, yeah, I would just like to know what the theological definition of evil is. Not bad enough to look it up on here, right <laughs> now, but you know. Well, there, like, there are some that come to my mind. Like, um, I don't know if it was Thomas Aquinas or some, but one of those guys. But they said uh, no, it was it was somebody before Aquinas. Anyway, um, they said that evil is um, the absence of good. So it's just like the. It's not know, what you believe, though. Yeah. What do I believe about evil? You believe that I know that you believe that it's. You know, like the opposite side of the coin of good. I do it's a spectrum, which I I'm not really on board with that. I don't I don't know that I believe that. So let me. I don't think evil exists outside of human beings. First of all, uh, I don't think natural disasters are evil. When people say, you know, you know, how I would God allow an earthquake to kill, you know, thirty thousand people in Turkey? I don't think that's evil. I think that's just something that happened. Not a good thing. It's just something that happened. Evil exists only in human beings. And I, I don't know, I, I don't like, I haven't thought this through super well, maybe I should, but I, I, one of these ideas that's starting to pick up steam with me is the idea of, uh, the idea of a spirit. Mm. So you could say something like the spirit of the age, you know, that's the zeitgeist or yeah. the gestalt of, you know, the, our modern era, the spirit of what it's like to live in this time and be a human being now and here. There's that idea. But then there's like, the spirit of vengeance that fills you when you, you know, your wife's cheated on you and you, you see that guy and you want to punch him in the face. Um, then there's the spirit of, you know, like you can get filled and possessed by a spirit. I think there's something, I think there's something more real to that idea than we generally allow. Yeah, I agree. So I think somebody like the person who shall not be named, I don't want to focus on him too much. Voldemort? <laughs> that he's, he's possessed by a spirit. And it's the spirit, it's a spirit that sees the world as for him, you know, it, spirit, spirit, you mean like, like a, uh, would you describe the spirit as a pattern of behavior or would you describe the spirit as an actual entity? I don't know that there's a difference. So I think what happens is there is a pattern of behavior that does get hardwired into your nervous system and then it becomes real. Then it gets a grip on you because you have those, you have those wires that are built to, for the stimulus response and the reward signals. You've created that for yourself. Now you're much more likely to continue to act this in this shitty way. I believe that there's also something that begins that process, an idea, an impulse. Where does that come from? something that starts that, that gets reinforced by your body. Um, that's a little bit mystical. I don't know what that is. Anytime an idea strikes you, anytime an, an instinct strikes you, um, anytime a passion strikes you, it, it, you don't know where it comes from. And that's mystical. And I don't mm -hmm. know, I don't know what that means. Then there's the Jungian perspective that an archetype is, is a living entity. It's a spirit because it lives in your psyche. It's not a, it's not a physical thing. But it's independent of you. It's independent of your ego. And it exists and lives and you feed it, you know? And that's what that's what he's done. That behavior that gets reinforced is like feeding that demon, feeding that spirit. And in a way, it has its own motivations. You know, it wants to get drunk. It wants to escape responsibility. It wants to escape fear and work. It wants to be at peace and at rest. It wants to have no responsibility. And it's the spirit in you that wants that. And it's, it's independent of you. And that's when, and that's the strange thing. Psyche and spirit are the same thing. And when we talk about spirit, we usually mean some kind of otherworldly, you know, existence some sort something like angels and demons that exist in parallel to us and invisible and, and what i say, what i think is that whole dynamic is another way of talking about your psyche it's another way of talking about the forces that exist in your mind yeah uh that i mean i i'm like on the same page with you like right up until that point i am not 100 percent convinced that it is 100 percent outside of your mind i think that there's you mean 100% inside your mind? Or yeah, that's yeah, what that yeah, is what I meant yeah. to say. Um, the idea of external forces does not seem unrealistic to me at all. Um, and the way that you described that, 
I mean, there was definitely, you know, like hooks that were like keeping you in the, it is in the psyche. It is a part of you. Um, but a, a lot of the way that you were describing that did make it seem external. So let's focus in on that. So one of the things I said was that when you have that first impulse instinct idea that pops in your head that says, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't, if you didn't for a minute, if you could just fucking live in bliss, if you, for a minute, you could just escape all this, wouldn't that be nice? And you put that heroin needle in your arm and you go, fuck, it is nice. And then you're fucked for the rest of your life. What was it in the beginning before you had the physical addiction, before you developed the physiological things that kept you in prison, what, <laughs> what was that first thing? Did that come from you? So that's a great question. I don't know where ideas come from. I would, I want to say that they come from the unconscious and that in my mind, coming from the unconscious is what you just said, external. That doesn't mean from a from a fairy world. It doesn't mean from a heavenly realm. It doesn't mean something like that necessarily. Um, but maybe it doesn't it, but necessarily maybe it, not mean that either. Maybe it does. Yeah. Maybe it does. Um, I think we're connected. Obviously, our consciousness is connected to the unconscious. We just don't know what the unconscious is. We can say it's external, and I can agree with you. I can go with you there. But where it gets tricky for me is that my understanding of God is the combination of what consciousness and, and the unconscious. It's, it's them together. The unconscious part is what we would generally, I would generally call the God part. But in reality, God is the whole kit and caboodle. And you, you can't separate them. <clears throat> so is it external because I, is it external because it's coming from the unconscious, a entity that I don't feel like I have a direct connection to? But philosophically, in my mind, I, I know that I'm not I'm not distinct from the thing that we're calling the unconscious. So it gets tricky for me. I can I can agree with you that it's external, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, but it's not really external. It's just all one thing. Yeah, and I think that that's another like area where we split. Is I mean, I'm like on I'm like really close to on the same page with you in some ways. Like yeah. I do believe that there is an element of the divinity of God in everyone and everything. I do. I, I 100% believe that yep. that's like something that I have no doubt about. Um, but I do think that, I think that there's more of a separation um, than it seems to me like you do. Um, so I just don't, more, as far as like external, like things being external and from the subconscious and whether or not the subconscious is, you know, a part of us. Yep. I, I just don't, I don't know. So I think the distance between God and man is the, is the illusion that it's the, it's the thing that we call the veil of perception. The idea that we are distant from God is the, is the biggest trick we ever played on ourselves. That's what I think. When, when people, when people have, um, psychedelic experiences or mystical experiences and they say they'll say often that they had an encounter with something divine mm. and one of the things that they'll say commonly is that it's i can't believe i didn't notice it before it's it's the most obvious thing in the world and until i was in that altered state of consciousness i couldn't see it the thing that's right in front of your face that you can't see the thing that you're accustomed to, that you're desensitized to, you know, it's like, um, you know, you're driving down the freeway that you've done that drive a thousand times. And it's like you blink your eyes in your home and you have no memory of the thing that you just drove past because you've seen it so many times. You don't even pay attention to it anymore. It doesn't even register as a memory anymore. And that's what God is like. People, people live in it and they experience it all the time. Mm -hmm. And they can't see that it's not distant. It's right there. It's the very thing that you are. And uh, and it's a trick they've played on themselves. Yeah. I, I mean, I see what you're saying. And I think that there can be, you know, God being distant, God being some being that is somewhere um, away from you. Uh, and, you know, he can like – reveal himself to you uh but for the most part he's there you're here there's a separation i don't I, you know i don't believe that but i think that there can be a difference between 
that scenario where you're separate and God being all around you, like you were saying, right in front of your face yep. and not, that's not the same thing as you being God. You say that, but I don't, I don't agree. I, well, if you're in a bathtub, if you're in a swimming pool, are you the swimming pool? <clears throat> um. So the way I look at that, it's like, I see, it's hard to talk about. I see life as an, as a, oh boy, man, I, it's really, this is a difficult conversation. Every time I try to have this, this is a difficult conversation. Like I'm having this conversation with you. I'm looking at you in your eyes. And I know that there's something alive and there's a spark there. There's something there that if you were a dead body, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see. We all know that. We see that glassy look in the eyes. There's, there's something missing that you can't put your finger on that weirds you out. That's what weirds people out about death. It's like you see this body and that, that, that spark, that light in the eye is gone. There's nothing behind the eyes anymore. And I say the thing that's missing there is the spirit that, inha that once inhabited this body. But doesn't that, in spirit, doesn't that spirit inhabit everything? Yes, so doesn't it inhabit the dead body still? It well, if it inhabits the coffin that the body's in, you would think that it would still be in the body so, too. So we get in the weeds on this, but I would say that that there's this um, there's this theory. It's called uh, integrated information theory, and it, it provides a context for this. It's like there is a uh, level at which at which the consciousness is um, dominant. Mm -hmm. And when you die as this creature, that consciousness now doesn't exist as a creature, as a macro being. It, it, it now is broken up. The, the um, unifying thing is gone. Mm -hmm. And so where the spirit lives then is in all of the atoms, not in the body anymore, not in, not in this one way. It's, broke, it's broken down into its fractal components. They're alive. The, the coffin, the wood in the coffin, the atoms are in the coffin are just like that. They're alive and conscious in my mind to some degree. I don't, I don't, you know, there, there's no way of proving exactly to what degree or, or any of the details. That's just the model that I like, you know? So, um, I, yeah. So I would say that there, there still is God there and your body is still made of it, but it's not organized this, the same way. When you die, there is a qualitative change that takes place. Mm -hmm. But when I'm, when we're having this conversation and I'm looking at you, I see the universe alive and speaking through a body. I see God across from me right now, just like God is sitting in the seat that I'm in. We're, we're, we're speaking to, we're nature speaking to nature. We're God speaking to God. Um, that's what we are in my mind. And what makes that, this gets back to the evil thing we were talking about earlier. What, what makes this strange to me is that you are a way that God is. You're a way that God can be. God, you're the, you're God as, as Kyle. And then there's God as the sun and there's God as, you know, every, every other thing you can imagine. Um, but there's also God as the addict, God as the leech, God as the thing that is a drain on society, God as the thing that is a nihilist and anti-human and wants to bring everything down and thinks everything's meaningless. That's God also. It's possible for God to think that because people think that way. And what does that mean? See, that's the evil thing. It's like there's a potentiality. There's a way in which God can be that's not good. And we pretend that that's impossible, that God is only all good. And when, when we do that, I think we make a big mistake. Yeah, I don't know. I think that there's something to be said for free will, for the idea that God has given us free will and the, if you, you know, those are not the things that we're meant to be doing. And there's evidence for that and that it, those things make us miserable. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. I don't necessarily think that, I, what, what were the negative things that you just listed off? I don't even remember them, but whatever they were, <laughs> I don't necessarily believe that that is God necessarily, you know, maybe it's a, a possibility that God allows. Um, but 
What's the difference between a possibility that God allows or God itself? Um, well, I guess it sounds deterministic what you're saying. You know, it sounds like you, it's all, I, I don't know. It sounds. No, I don't, I don't mean that like my wife's uncle, let's say as an example, that he didn't have a choice to become like he is. I think, I think he did. That, that, I think that's why, that, that's the only reason why I feel uh, like it's, it's valid for me to um, criticize his behavior because he could have been different. He could have acted differently. He could have become somebody differently. Yeah. He, he's at fault to me. I'm like, you're at fault agree. for not, not having developed yourself. Um, so but what I'm saying is it's, it's possible to become what he has become. And in, to my mind, if everybody is an embodiment of God, if everybody is, um, go ahead, man. I'm, I, I just think that like the things that you think that people should be doing and the things that you think people shouldn't be doing when they're doing the things that they should be doing, they're accepting God. They're accepting the things that God wants. And when they're doing the other things, they're rejecting the path that God has laid out. Sure. And the fact that it's possible for, for God to reject its own edicts, the fact that that's possible is hard, is hard to rationalize. And that's, but that's where we break down because I don't believe that we are God the, the same way that you do. Um, like I said, I believe that there's an element of God's divinity in us, but I don't think that's the same thing as saying that we are God. Do you think that the element of, of divinity that we share, do you think that is responsible for our life and consciousness? Um, yeah, probably. Okay. So that, so I, that's sort of what I believe too. I believe that, uh, when, like when the Bible says we're made in the image of God, that it means something like that. It means that, uh, the part of us that's divine is the part of us that the nature breathe and, you know, that's the, that's a mathematical law of physics, let's say, but whatever that is, that's, that's what God is. It's the thing that lives in us. And um, yeah, um, it's hard for me to say that if the thing that we share with God is the thing that makes us alive, if the thing that turned the universe into a living, breathing, moving, acting, you know, uh, conglomeration of things, um, that that's the thing in us that lives. I don't know how to make a distinction between between saying that there's a part of God in me or saying that the thing I am, the thing thing that I identify as my consciousness in my life is God. Can you do all the things that God can do? It's a great question. It's a great question. It's not clearly no to me. It's not clearly no to me. Yeah. I mean, we could say God created something from nothing. Can you do that? And there's an instinct that says no. And then you're like, not so fast. Wait a, wait a goddamn minute there. Do we create something from nothing? And we can get into this weird, we can get into this weird philosophical conversation, but we do, let's say, invent technology. So we invent ideas that can be applied in the world that turn into things like machines and robots and chemicals. And those things didn't exist until we brought them into being. So there's something like that. But then it doesn't have to be that grandiose either. Like this thing that we're doing right now. This, this talking thing we're doing is just as fascinating to me as as inventing something that didn't used to exist, writing a book, a story, a movie, a song that didn't used to exist, those kind of things. Um, that you could you would agree that you've created something, something tangible, something we can share, something that will exist longer than your life. That's that's pretty amazing. And uh, and this this thing that we're doing now, talking is like that. I have these ideas, like we said earlier, not entirely sure where ideas come from, especially when they surprise you. Something comes out of your mouth and you're like, where did that come from? Happens all the time. Um, I'm taking those ideas that are coming from God knows where. I am vibrating the, f the fabric of space and time with my fucking vocal cords to make these messages, to make these this information 
communicable to you and understandable to you and to everybody listening. Um, that's creating something from nothing. I see no difference in me, you know, giving a poetic monologue like I'm trying to do right now and everybody listening, you know, this something, this content that I've created wouldn't have existed. <laughs> it came from nowhere and I've made it real. And now it's living in your mind. <clears throat> Did it come from nowhere though? It's a good question. Wait, how, how do you see it? I mean, Let's take your solo episodes, the most recent solo episode you did that I did listen to, by the nice. way. Um, Alan that didn't. Oh, no. I was oh. talking about the Jordan Peterson one. Oh, yeah. I yeah, didn't yeah. realize another one had come out. No, no. Um, that didn't come from nowhere. That came from the Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson conversation. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, you know, like the Alfred North Whitehead episodes, mm -hmm. they they came from Alfred, Alfred North Whitehead. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, I guess your spin on them I guess came from nowhere. Um, and I was going to say Alfred North Whitehead's ideas came from nowhere, but they didn't, they came from Hegel. Um, yep. So, you, you know, well, you can, but you can trace that back like, like the postmodernists would do and say, if my, you know, <clears throat> like putting aside the fact that I might have novel ideas that really are uh, my own, you know, that didn't come from anywhere, they were certainly influenced by the things that, you came know, before. came before it. Yeah. But you can continue to do that. You can take those ideas all the way back to the very first human being and say, where did, where did those ideas come from then? Now we're back to the mystery again. Now we're back to the mystery. You know, the, the ideas come from somewhere. The epiphany comes from some, somewhere. The epiphany. The epiphany comes from somewhere. That's what we're going to call this episode. The epiphany comes from somewhere? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, man. Good questions. I, uh. I've been really thinking about this idea of nothingness. Um, it, we were talking about something from nothing. Yeah. And I did this episode on Alan Watts. Um, so I, so part of the credit goes to you on that for making that Alan Watts is a recommendation for me. Uh, although you, I recommended it and you ignored the recommendation and like came to it on your own. Not, so yeah, not really. But it's not fair to call it ignored. It's not, no, it's I, not ignored. I, 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 I just have so many things that get tossed at me or that I run into that I just cannot do at all. I can't do them all and I have to be selective about it. But, yeah. uh, so I did an episode on Alan Watts. It's called nothing matters with Alan Watts is what I called it. Cause I listened to two of his lectures and he talked a lot about nothingness. And I thought, you know, it was really cool. He said, he said the secret to the whole thing. And he didn't specify what he means by this, but I kind of understand the secret to the whole thing is that nothing is something. That's what he said. The secret to the deepest mysteries and all the questions, that, the deepest questions, where did this all come from? What does it mean? You know, what are the origins? What is God? All of that stuff is answered when you understand that nothing is something. And then he goes on to explain what he means by that. And I thought it was fucking brilliant. Yeah. So when we say something from nothing, the nothing part, that's God. The thing that we call nothing, the reason we call it nothing, the reason we call God nothing or, or we even, uh, you know, can even tie those two words together is because what God is and what God does is invisible to us. It's not, it's not material, whatever it is. It's not, uh, it doesn't obey the laws of physics, whatever it is. Physics doesn't allow something to come from nothing. It just doesn't allow it. So if the world didn't exist and was brought into existence, it, the laws of physics were broken at least once. So this thing that we call God is immaterial, not subject to space and time, has no limits on, on its fecundity or power. It's nothing like the world. You just take the nothing like the world part, you erase that, and you're left with nothing. We think God is nothing, and we have, these, we have this biased intuition that nothing means like it meant in a never-ending story. You know, it's, what the nothing came through and destroyed Fantasia. Well, what do you mean? Was there a hole? No, there wasn't a hole. There was just nothing. That's what it says in the book. You know, it's not anything like you think it is. Nothing is not anything like you think it is. It's actually something, not just something. It's the most important something. It's the something from which all things come. You know, that's God. That's the invisible nothing that we that we brush off as nothing. You know, and Alan Watts fucking nailed that. It was great. Then, yeah. then I started re reading. Not I wasn't reading. Go ahead. You're listening. I was listening. I, I just like. 
I don't know. I, I don't understand the need to call it nothing because nothing does mean something. It means nothing. I, I understand. You know, I like I get what he's saying. I just. That seems like a, a bit of um, and you the Alan Watts is definitely guilty of this and guilty. I, I don't mean it like a bad thing, yeah. but he's definitely he's a, a showman. You know, yeah. he's like he's up there giving a speech. It's not just a boring professor speech. He's Correct. a he's an entertaining, yes. charismatic yes. guy. Uh-huh. Um, and I just don't like taking nothing and like me making it mean something like, I don't know. I, I know. Wish. See, I say, I know you don't like it because I understand that feeling, but what he's pointing out is the feeling you have that resists it, that resists it. That's the thing that's wrong. That's the thing you have to get rid of. You have to get rid of the part of you that resists thinking that nothing couldn't possibly be something that, that there's a model there's a model of the world that says nothing means exactly what we imagine it means, non-existence, something like that. But non-existence isn't nothing. It's not the absence of existence. It's something else. It's not, it's not like, like if I take positive one and negative one and I put them together and they annihilate and I'm left with nothing, we can think about that, that I no longer have a one anymore you know, of, of either power. But we can also say that what I'm left with isn't isn't the absence of one. What I'm left with is the potential for any number. Zero is the idea of numbers. The, you know, understanding that zero is is something means that it it can be any possible number. It represents a framework of math. It represents a frame framework of numerical reality. That's not nothing. That's something, something very, very significant. So there's something like that. And, and Alan Watts uses examples from Taoism, which I think are kind of interesting. Well, he, he says uh, what the Tao Te Ching says, that the value of a, of a bowl is not in the wood bowl. It's in the nothing in, 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 in the nothing in between. That allows you to put something in it. The value of a house isn't the wood. It's the nothing inside that allows you to live in it. Yeah, that nothing is something. It's very important. Something we can't pretend as though it's it's nothing. Yeah, again, I mean, I, again, I understand, and I come. I actually like completely agree. I just don't like the language trick. The the see, I don't think it's a language trick. I th- I think it is a, a cha- it's a way of changing the model, like Newtonian I gravity versus Einstein. I don't understand the point in calling it nothing when I like the word that you just used potential mm-hmm. seems less like a trick, less like a, a showman's flair, you know? Yes. And I, and I agree with you and I like the word potentiality and I use it a lot, but nobody, nobody uses that word. Nobody fucking even knows what I mean when I say potentiality. So you so you're just going to start saying nothing in place of it. No, I won't. Yeah. But I but think Alan, Al, I almost said Alan Cox. <laughs> no, I think when people hear the word nothing, they never think of the word potentiality. Yeah. And Alan Watts is saying, you should. So I've got part two coming out of this series, which I didn't realize was going to be a part, was going to be a second parter. Uh, what happened was I had a bunch of audible credits. Because oh. at the end of the, or this time of year, I get like 15 free credits or something. Why? Because I have a membership. like an annual. Yeah, so do I. I don't get a bunch of extra fucking credits. I get, I get like 15 free credits every year. Somehow. What? Yeah, I'm <laughs> fucking sending an email to Bezos <laughs> immediately. Uh, so I, I was looking through the books, and one of them was called um, The God Equation. It was a Michio Kaku book. Yeah. And I like those uh, physicists that will dumb it down for me because I need that, you yeah. know. And so I'll listen to, like, Sean Carroll or I'll listen to um, – uh, what's that dude? Green. Brian, Brian Green, Green. Thank you. That's the guy. I'll listen to those guys. Do you um, listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson? No. No, fuck that, dude. No, he pissed me off too many times. Yeah, he's a – Homo. But I never listened to Michio Kaku, even though I've seen him like on d- tons of documentaries. Yeah. So I decided to listen to the book and a little bit in the beginning and then a whole bunch during the Hawking chapters towards the end of the book, he talks about uh, the vacuum of space, mm. which is which is nothingness. And the way he was talking about it, I, it was so complimentary to the Alan Watts conversation. I, I just felt inspired. I was like, I was like, OK, so I have this episode co- that's already published called Nothing Matters with Alan Watts. So I'm going to do one called Nothing Matters with Michio Kaku. And I'm going to do this uh, co- compliment because what it is is a scientific, strictly empirical scientific perspective on all this philosophical stuff that Alan Watts was talking about. 
and it boils down to it boils down to a concept called zero point energy or vacuum energy. We've talked about it a little bit before, but I didn't really know much about it. I just kind of vaguely understood it as a concept. And basically it goes like this. Michio Kaku says that space and time is filled with matter and energy. And if you take all of the matter and energy out of it, hypothetically, you're left with nothing. And that creates a vacuum. In fact, that's what space is, vacuum. Um, so if you can imagine outer space without any uh, matter or energy in it, um, even even at the coldest possible temperatures, like you don't have external sources of heat, like like a like a star or something that that brings energy into the system, that what you had, what you have then is the the vacuum. You have you have nothingness, and in that vacuum, there's energy. It's called zero point energy. It's the lowest energy level that's possible. And what that means is you cannot eliminate all of the energy. It's impossible to suck out everything. You're left with something even when you have nothing. And then Michio Kaku goes on to talk about what happens in the quantum vacuum. It's like you've got this uh, vibration, this very faint vibration of energy that's happening in the fabric of space-time, whatever that means. And every now and then, particles will pop out of it. You have electron, anti-electron pairs that just pop, pop, pop out of the vacuum. Then they annihilate, and they go back into the vacuum, they disappear. What you get is something from nothing. If by nothing, we mean the vacuum. And particles emerge from it, and then every now and then, one of them escapes and doesn't annihilate back into the vacuum. And that's how you end up with matter that may also be how we we ended up with our universe like the one we exist in that it popped out like a bubble hawking calls it the quantum foam pops out like a bubble from the quantum foam doesn't it doesn't get annihilated immediately but manages to escape all into into the universe yeah uh anyway the point is into more nothing it's just floating around through more nothing exactly the point though because in that floating around through nothing illustrates the point that nothing is something because what is it floating in? <clears throat> what is it floating in if, if nothing is nothing the way we generally think about? And how can particles pop out of the nothing if the nothing is nothing? So I think the Michio Kaku stuff. Not Zach. <laughs> but that's my word. But I, I do get it. But, but that's part of the illusion is that. This is why it's hard to have this conversation because everybody that, this, that hears this, when they hear the word nothing, and it's the only word we'd, we've ever had to describe it, um, thinks that means non-existence or non, you know, something like that. Yeah. And it doesn't. And maybe it never has meant that because there's no such thing as nothing. And I think that's fucking true, man. Yeah. I don't think that it's necessarily untrue. It's just the words that I have a problem with. Um, so do you think that quantum um, radiation that I'm talking about, the zero-point energy, do you think that is a <coughs> like a physical representation of God? It's the thing that can create actual things from, from nothingness from potentiality, that the same potentiality that it is, whatever it is. I don't think, what, what do you mean? Is it a representation, a physical representation of God? Well, it's something that physicists have evidence exists. This, this, this zero point energy, they have some sort of physical math and maybe experimental evidence that this thing exists. It actually exists. Yeah. And what it is, what this thing is that exists in the physical world is something that creates from nothing. That's what we call God. So is it the physical manifestation of God? I don't know. I don't know either. My my immediate reaction is to say no, um, because I my idea of whatever God is is beyond our ability to like measure and observe. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Maybe it's like some like aspect of what God is that the, I, I have no idea, but mm -hmm. I, like I said, my immediate reaction is to say no, because I don't think you're going to find God with a ruler. No, but I think if you say God is, is the creator, and then you look at zero point energy and you say, what is that? Can you call that the creator? An argument can be made. 
Um, and then we can get really hippy dippy and imagine that the radiation that comes from nowhere, this energy that flows out of nowhere, if that's the source of all material reality and all the energy that that allows you know action and motion and and so forth in the world, maybe that's the thing that resonates through us that we call life and consciousness. You know, you ever see like um, one of those uh, thermal cameras? You know, you can see the the radiation just pouring off of our bodies. You know, and if we were dead, we wouldn't see that. You know, is there <laughs> is the radiation? Is that is you know, I'm not the first person to say that. There's lots of people that that say that the thing that we call energy and the thing that we call consciousness might really be the same thing. Yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, I I, I don't know. You know, you'd think that I would know this, but I think it's strictly an orthodox thing. Uh, I was I said you'd think I would know this because I grew up in Protestant churches, but I really don't know what they think about this. I suspect that they don't think about it like this too much. Um, but, you know, part of the Orthodox view is that there's God and God is not created. God has been here forever. God created everything. Right. Uh, but part of God is what they call the uncreated energies of God. And I don't know what all of those are, but I know that like love is one of them. Mm. Um, and I, I would assume that consciousness on some level is like one of those uncreated energies of God. But again, I, I'm not like an Orthodox expert, so yeah. I don't know. Um, but that just makes me think of that. Um, the energies, yeah. you know, yeah. um, that makes me think of, I, you probably didn't see this, but, uh, there was a debate online between somebody we've talked on the show about. Uh, numerous times. I think last week we talked about him, Owen Benjamin. And do you know who Made by Jim Bob is? Mm -mm. He does a bunch of like cartoon memes. Um, you've probably seen I've probably them. seen them, yeah. Um, and he is, you know, he got like popular making memes that like a bunch of normies liked, you know. Um, but now he's more, I would say, a truther kind of a person, a person who doesn't believe a lot of the stuff that like many people just accept. Yep. Um, and he, he's a really interesting guy. I didn't know that he was Orthodox. Um, so it, they had a debate about the Trinity. Um, obviously Jim Bob taking the Orthodox position, the Trinity is real, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Owen saying that he doesn't believe the Bible says anywhere in it, explicitly that there's a trinity and I, I think he's right about that i mean explicitly there is a trinity and it is god the father god jesus christ the son and the holy spirit mm -hmm. that's not in there you know it's, uh, i think you're they, right yeah. they don't lay that out that the most explicit it ever is is when in luke when john the baptist baptizes jesus and jesus is baptized and god speaks from the heavens and he says you are my son and whom i am well pleased right and um, then the Holy Spirit in the form of a, a dove yep. comes down. So yeah. that's like the closest it comes in scripture to being this, the Trinity is real. Um, but so there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in Christianity that is not in the Bible. And a lot of Protestant people have a, a, a problem with that. I don't necessarily have a problem with that because the Bible is not exactly clear, you know, so you have to have people, intelligent, you know, Christian philosophers to come in and like figure things out. Yep. And logically, when they lay it out, it's internally consistent. You know, you, you may not believe what they believe, but if you do believe what they believe, the worldview makes sense, you know, um, and – I, I don't know. I just well, thought I just thought the the debate was interesting. I, I'm a big Owen Benjamin fan. He did not impress me in the debate. Debate. He's not. He's not like a natural debate guy. Yeah. Um, and his biggest point was that the Trinity isn't spelled out explicitly in the Bible. No, I mean, so Jim Bob was utilizing more like you know logical, like a, a logical debate argument. Uh, Owen was just more relying strictly on rhetoric, you know, like, I don't think that I, I don't honestly don't think that Owen did a whole bunch of, uh, research into what Jim Bob's position was going to be. Yep. Um, and Jim Bob is, I think just a more 
experienced debater than Owen is. So, so Owen probably thought he didn't need to prepare yeah. because the guy's religious arguments were bunk. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, if you don't believe what Jim Bob, Jim Bob believes, uh, the questions that Owen w- is rhetorically putting out there make sense. It's like, you know, if, if God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same per- same thing, who was, who was Jesus praying to in the garden? Like when it says that, uh, you know, I sit at the right hand of my father, who, if it's you, are you sitting at the right hand of yourself that, you know? Um, so if you don't already believe what Jim Bob believes, that's a good question. You know, I, I do think you're sitting at the right hand of yourself. I think there, I know you I, do. <laughs> I, think, I think there's some fractal, uh, some fractal image there that like strikes me as, um, correct. Yeah. And that just comes from from psychedelic experience, but yep. it strikes me as correct. So there are some f- passages in the Bible that I like, but I don't entirely understand. Maybe that's why I like them so much. But in the in in the book of Genesis, where 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 God says after He creates the the world that the Spirit of God was on the face of the waters, or on the surface of the waters, or the surface of the deep, or whatever it says. So, so you have this idea of a, the spirit of God floating over top of this primordial ocean. That's a very cool fucking picture in my head. I love that. But I don't understand, is the spirit of God like something like we would we were trying to describe when we said the Holy Spirit came down like a dove? Is the spirit of God not God? Is it something God is sending down? Or is it God itself? And then... And then you have that get picked up in the Gospel of John when it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Because the Word, the Logos, is connected to the Spirit of God that was on the surface of the, of the waters. Mm. So is that God, or is that, or is the Spirit of God not God? Is it something else? So, I mean, again, I'm not a theologian. Jim Bob's not a theologian, uh, but he knows more than I do. Um and the way they were saying it is <laughs> that it's it is both. It is an element of God, like it is God, and it's an element of God. And it's like, does God transcend one? Yes. Is God one thing? No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, but that's that's the other side of it. Does yes. God also transcend many? Yes. So there you go. It's like, in what? capacity can you say that god cannot be one thing and many things at the same time i i think that's in, that's the mis- that is the mystery in a nutshell and i'll, I'll like uh, they may i, I don't know i i want to dig into it more because the stuff that jim bob was saying was really interesting and owen was just kind of blowing past it saying that it was like word salad and uh you know like uh deceptive techniques like he Jim Bob was trying to get Owen to commit to doing an internal critique. Like you, you don't have to believe what I say, but just grant me that it is true and come into the worldview and try to pull it apart that way. Yep. Uh, and just Owen was just not having any of it, but he said a lot of really interesting things. Jim Bob did. And like he said, is love, you know, which we talked about as a, one of the uncreated energies of God um, is love based in God. Uh, and I, Owen was like, you know, I, I'm going to have to think about that. But I, I think even Owen immediately leans towards yes, you know. Um, and if God was just one, he didn't have the the capacity to transcend one and be many, that love could only ever be self-centered. You know, you could never love outwardly. Uh, but the fact that there is this many aspect of God that allows it to be, you know, I don't know, external love in some way. Yep. Well, there's the, that, that example. I use that. I focus on that example a lot, but I don't use love as the, uh, as the, as the uh, driver. What I, what I talk about is um, experience. So if God is one, the only experience that's possible is Mm self-experience. God has to become many in order to have an experience of itself. Um, You know, that, that, perspective of subject and object is necessary for experience. So if, if God is one thing, and I believe that's a mystical truth, I, I believe anybody who's had a mystical experience can argue with almost anything but that fact. God is one. Um, and and But experience isn't possible if God is one. 
and experience is all that we know to be true with certainty. So God, if you're a mystic, God is both one and many, and there's no way around it. Yep. And that's the great mystery is trying to reconcile. God is one and many. God is potentiality and actuality. God is being and non-being. God is good and evil. You know? Yeah. Would you ever consider doing a debate, like a formal debate? Um, I might. I might. I would. Um, oh, I would probably only be interested in doing that if it was in good faith. Yeah. And if it was something that was being done uh, open-mindedly, as as edu- as educational, not specifically as. Uh, I'm not going to go out there and argue with somebody just to argue. I used to like that. I don't anymore. I don't like to just argue for the sake of taking the other position, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It would have to be something that like meant something to you. And yeah. Would it, somebody would have to say, listen, I disagree with you on these things, but I'm very interested to, to actually have the conversation with you. Would, would you want to go on the podcast and do it? The answer is fuck. Yes. If you're, if you are, uh, in good faith and you are, uh, you know, open to learning and you're not just trying to shove your, you know, your, uh, opinion down my throat, I'm a hundred percent on board. I, I would, I would do that. Do you have somebody in mind or something? No, no. Well, I mean, I could think of people that I would like to see you debate. Um, I am not really interested in doing formal debate. I'll have a conversation, but I, debate seems stressful and I'm not, yeah. I just don't want to do it. Um, I, I don't know. I do have some desire to do it, but, um, I want to go back to this idea of the spirit of God for a minute. So we were tr- I was asking whether whether God in the story, whether God is sending his spirit down as though it's something that's not him exactly. Um, I wonder if that has something to do with the, you know, man being made in the image of God the thing that we talked about earlier. It's like the spirit of God comes down to the material cosmos and inhabits it. And so that's, you know, that's the, the, in- the incarnation that's, you know, the material world being possessed by the spirit of God, be, being made to live. Like in the Bible, God breathes breathes life into the clay that becomes Adam and Eve, that kind of thing. The spirit comes from comes from heaven and is brought down to earth. That's the exact same symbolism as Jesus, by the way, as, as God coming to earth. Um, so in that example, what we share in common with God, that divine spark that we're we were talking about earlier, is the spirit of God that's been that's been made materially real and so the question i have is is the same question does is the spirit of god being made real does that mean mean god they're different when i say we are god this is all god i don't see a difference in the idea that the spirit of god comes down to be made flesh i i don't i don't think that there I don't think there's a distinction between God and the spirit of God, I think is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I know that you think that. I, I just like, um, I don't know. I don't know. Like, yeah, I know that you think that. <laughs> um, uh, what What is important to you about God being separate from you? It just seems to me like that is the truth. I'm not necessarily saying that it's important to me. Um, and I'm also not claiming that I know either, right, no, you know, yeah. um, I think that you are way closer to claiming that, you know, than I am. Well, um, go ahead. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about cause I do feel like I know the truth, some truth, but I can't exactly articulate it. Even though I try really hard, um, having, having knowledge and not being able to communicate it is kind of like not having knowledge at all. Um, but I don't have knowledge necessarily that God exists. What I had was an experience of being God. So it's not exactly knowledge. It's not like I can't deny it because I, I became it. I, I, I can't deny it because I was it for a moment. And so that's why I'm certain about things or that's why I – come across as as confident like i have knowledge it's not exactly knowledge i don't know it i was it this is best i can do to to <clears throat> explain why i come across that way yeah yeah uh, i mean you know a lot of people a lot of people who i think would take positions 
more close to what I think uh, I, I think would be just as confident. I'm just not. Um, so I, I don't know. I think there's something to having faith um, and not knowing, you know? Um, so I, I don't know. That's something to consider too. Let's talk about faith for a second. So I can tell you that I always had an interest in religion. You know that. And I explored it, it, you know, most of my life in various ways. And one of the things I never questioned is that there is a God. There is God, not, not a God, that there is God. I never questioned it. It never seemed to, it seemed to me to be beyond reproach. So I never considered really that there might not be God because I never could understand how there, how there could be anything without God. Yeah. So I never really questioned it, but I did question everything else. Yeah. I, I, I did question God. Um, but looking back on it now, I don't really understand how I did. It was, you know, some kind of cognitive dissonance. Uh, I honestly believe that is, that is one area you know, I said that I'm not sure of many th- of anything really, but that is one thing that I am sure of is that there is God, you know, there is something. Yeah. Um, and I really don't see any kind of logical argument to the contrary of that. I think that people who try to make those arguments just sound ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, once once you've given them an opportunity to talk themselves out, you're like, no, that doesn't make any sense. See, I, I would like to have that kind of debate with um, with like a rational atheist type person and i tried online but that's not the way place to do it yeah but what happens is it boils down to definitions and i can never get these these people to agree that their definition and my definition of god are coinciding they will never admit it so so the argument that i use basically goes something like this either god has always existed well, not, we, don't, we don't have to use the word God. We can talk about the cosmos. We could say either the cosmos has always existed or it came into being at some point. Can we agree on that? Usually people will say yes. Or we can agree. One of those two situations has to be true. So then I say, okay, as soon as you say yes to that, you've given up, you've given up the whole argument. Because either the thing that has always existed that generates stars and black holes and galaxies and people and consciousness and everything else – that thing that we call nature, either that is the immortal, eternal creator, and we could call that God easily, or if the cosmos was created, if it had a beginning, then it was created by something. We can say nothing about what that something is, but we can call it God. And atheists will never agree with me on, they will never allow that. And and I think that's the truth. I think that, you know, God is is either the thing that the fundamental reality, the, the infinite eternal thing that has always existed and always will, whatever that is, I can tell you no details about it. Either that is God, or um, shit, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Happens, but uh, but but I think there's only those two possibilities, and atheists, scientists, rationalist type people like that will never agree that. Whatever it is we point to to say this is the creator or this is the eternal fundamental reality, either one of those definitions to me is God. You can call it quantum fields. You can call it mathematical you know, abstractions if you want to all day long, fine. But you, what you're calling a mathematical ab- abstraction that is responsible for the cosmos is another fancy fucking way of saying G-O-D, my friend. Yeah. And nobody will ever budge on that that I've spoken to. Yeah. Now they're like mentally incapable of conceding that, you know, yes. they've got like a block, you know? Yeah. They, they think that their idea is scientific and was uh, like toyed out of the nature of reality that with lots of brain power, we've been able to figure mm-hmm. out and they, they cannot reconcile that with, a fantasy uh, idea from the Stone Age. They cannot, cannot reconcile those two. They feel like if they did, they would be, they would be granting reality to fantasy fairy tales, imaginary nonsense. And not only that, they'd be tying it to the most certain empirical mathematical abstractions that, that are the, the height of human accomplishment. 
they can't bring them they can't bring them together you know yep makes for like uh if you are going to debate a person, it makes for like, I, I guess the point in a debate is not trying to change that person's mind, but the people watching, you know, because uh, if the point is to change that person's mind, it makes for like a fruitless debate, you know, because it's not going to happen. I, I wish that debates were honest and they weren't structured like they have been, you know, in academia for hundreds and hundreds of years. I wish people were allowed to change their mind in a debate. I wish the debate could be resolved without the audience's input. Like if you can change my mind and I am, am not so proud that I, I'll, you know, nod my head and agree and say, that's where I, what I didn't understand. Now I'm on board. That should be able to happen in debates. Yeah, but that's ne that's not, well, I'm not going to say never, but most of the time that's not going to happen. And so having the audience, that's like the only change that is going to happen is the people in the audience most of the time like 98 percent of the time the two participants are not changing their mind yeah it's sad though yeah i can tell you that there's been many times where you've changed my mind and i appreciate that like steven crowder yeah only yeah. not gay oh buddy um but yeah i would like to get you into a debate i think that uh you might want to pick your topic pick the debate topic very carefully because so uh, like that debate happened between Jim Bob and Owen and it happened on Jim Bob's YouTube channel. Um, but the guy who moderated it is a guy who he's got a YouTube channel of his own called the crucible and they just have tons of debates. Nice. Um, and people who argue things like, uh, like Hegelianism tend to not do well mm. because it's so, yeah. How are you supposed to? Yeah. Yeah. And you go up against somebody who, you know, like I said, the Bible is unclear about things, but a lot of these, especially Orthodox people, they have these church fathers who are very intelligent, very philosophically minded people Yes, who, who like they've got, again, it, as an internal critique, it's hard to pull apart because they've really, you know, um, they've got a, a foundation for their argument, whereas the Hegelian types, it's like, I don't know. I just like, yeah. it's just, it's the way I feel, man. You know? Um, so yeah, you just gotta, I mean, if you could do well, if anybody could do well from that side, that would be impressive because all of the ones that I've seen, they don't, they don't go over well. My, my favorite Hegel quote is in the very beginning of um, uh, phenomenology of spirit. And it, it says, it says self-consciousness has before itself another self-consciousness. And I think that's extremely profound and it's, it's it re filled brimming with meaning for me. I've like un unpacked that to the T. Like I, I've pulled so much out of thinking about that one line, but if on the surface it's confusing. And if I was trying to debate somebody based upon Hegelianism, I have to explain how that makes sense you know, before I can make any points, it would be so burdensome yeah. to try to argue from, from that perspective. Self-consciousness has before itself another self-consciousness. The fuck does that mean? I have no idea. Turns out it means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <sighs> I know, man. I don't know either. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to also mention, I, uh, I, I told you I was reading the Vedas. I still have more, uh, episodes I'm going to be doing on the Vedas. Um, but I was introduced to a lot of the Hindu gods reading the Vedas, and uh, one of them, Indra, uh, uh, comes up a lot. And in Indra is called the Thunder Armed and the Thunderer. He's a god of the sky, and he's associated with thunder. He's also the king of the gods, so he at, sits at the top of the hierarchy. And uh, I knew that the um, that the uh, Sanskrit stuff was connected to the Proto-Indo-European stuff really closely. It's like a very ancient uh, culture that has ties all throughout the Middle East and Europe, you know, in, in interesting ways. But I didn't realize how much Indra and Zeus were like identical. Both sky gods, both kings of the gods, both thunder wielding. You know, I just blew my mind, man. Yeah, that in one of the debates that I was listening to, because I've listened to a lot of those crucible debates, um, somebody, I can't remember who, was talking about, you know, the atheist position, the materialist position is that, you know, you get 
water and then in the that water you get you know i, I don't know I don't even know what it is like what like what it was some kind of primordial ooze that turned into a single cell organism somehow and uh, uh one of the like popular i don't know theories for how that happened is that lightning struck the water and some but they, he compared that whoever it was compared that to like that's just like a branch of the zeus mythology you know it's like the zeus threw the lightning down there and created life it's kind of interesting yeah it makes you wonder, uh, yeah, that that uh, primordial soup, they call it, uh, the, the primitive ancient oceans that are filled with proteins and nutrients from deco decomposing, you know, uh, whatever, stuff that comes out of the volcanic vents and stuff that rains down from asteroids and, you know, all that. So that's what we're supposed to imagine. And I have heard that before, that uh, like you get this Frankenstein picture where you've, yeah. got, you've got all the – pieces of a, of a creature but it doesn't have any life in it and you shoot a lightning bolt into it and fucking you know seems silly it seems silly but i i, I don't i can't say that it's not not possible you yeah. know i don't know what this well is. it seems silly in the sense that it just happened on accident to me like the fact that it like they just happened to be right there and the lightning hit and now we got life yeah. seems silly to me yeah um and I would imagine that it seems silly to you too. Like, I mean, I'm thinking it through. I'm thinking it through right now. It's like, uh, it's like the laws of physics only allow certain things to happen. You know, it's like limits. So, uh, so you end up with the possibility for only certain types of um, um, atoms you know, to, to form like, yeah, that's what happens when stars, when stars start to burn helium and hydrogen turn into heavier elements. And then when stars explode, you know, we get things like lead and gold and other things that, that show up. So you only have possibility for certain things to be there in the primordial soup, mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and those same laws that allow for those elements to exist and for water to form like it did. And for the earth to form those same laws create are allow for, um, weather phenomena. Those exact same laws that allow for certain atoms to exist and certain molecules or whatever it was that was floating around in the ocean, those are the same laws that allow for th thunderstorms and earthquakes. And so it's like, is it random? If it if it f happened that way, that raw materials w were able to form on the earth and that eventually – you know, storms, you know, cr crazy weather and storms would create huge amounts of electricity that gets discharged into the oceans. It's like that all seems random, but in it, 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 at it, 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 that because there's certain many things that could have, that could have, uh, you know, been created. The circumstances, the conditions are limited and the laws that allow for all of those things to happen that that created the primordial soup in the ancient earth were also allowing electricity to build up in the atmosphere and to shoot down at the water does that is that random or is that all part of the natural scheme of things does life form that way elsewhere in exactly the same way you know i don't know i uh what is the difference between it being natural and it being like the natural scheme of things and it being random? I guess there, I guess there really isn't one, but I don't really know what random means. Me neither. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people that say like, um, everything that can happen will happen. Yeah. And I think there's something like that. It's like the, the laws of physics limit the possibilities of what can happen. But anything that can happen will happen, and that includes life. We know that because we fucking are alive, so we know that that can happen, and it did happen. I'm not willing to grant as a given that the laws of physics limit the things that can happen. Well, but some people will say that the laws of physics might change over it extremely large spans of time or maybe they differ from universe to universe and so maybe there are other possibilities that exist in other universes but within our system if the laws of physics are are static then i think they do limit possible in fact i think it's necessary because i think if all possibilities could manifest themselves 
nothing would manifest. Like we, there needs to be like, so in my mind, the model is God is infinite and it needs to be made finite in order for it to exist. So I'm not, I'm not saying that like we will ever be able to operate outside of the laws of physics. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that that's, you know, in the cards, uh, but I just don't know that like everything that happens in existence is bound by the same laws of physics that we sure. are. Um, I would agree because I believe that there is reality over and above the material. I don't know what that it means. I think our religious traditions have always talked about a spiritual reality. Um, and we've, we've figured out a way of writing that off. And then Carl Jung brought that back in when he's talking about unconscious reality. You know, that's something like the spiritual world that we always acknowledged before that we've, that we've, you know, in relatively modern history, we've rejected. I believe there is more to reality than the physical material cosmos. Maybe the majority of reality is outside. Even physicists, this is something that Michio Kaku brought up. He's string theory. The formulas have determined that reality is 10 or 11 dimensional. With certainty that he says that reality fundamentally, that all the formulas work if they assume that reality is 10 or 11 dimensional. So what that means is we walk around in four dimensions in a reality of 10 or 11. And even that tells you there is more, much more to reality, to existence than the material cosmos. There is potentially like we're looking at a two dimensional stick figure on a piece of paper that can never, even if it was conscious, could never have any, um, you know, uh, awareness of the reality of, of me in three or four dimensions that we have that out, out, you know, running parallel to this three-dimensional world there's there's vastly more to the physics that we do not understand and do not have access to what do you think of that you think that extra dimensionality it could be a explanation for what people have always called a spiritual reality the heaven the realm of god or the realm of the gods but yeah maybe but i i don't think that if we were to discover like you know not out evidence that that's the truth i don't think that that would i think that that is still you know like the realm of the gods or whatever you know what i mean um but i i, I have no idea well if you can imagine that there is a 10 or 11 dimensional reality mm -hmm. that that organism that creature that exists <clears throat> or whatever it is that exists at that level would be you could you could you can imagine that thing as as God, the complete, the wholeness of reality. You could call that God. And then that would make us the little three-dimensional part of it. That would make us part of God in that sense, living within God, which is something I believe. I believe that reality is something that exists within God. Um, does that model make us God, though, like I think we are? <clears throat> We're just a small part of it, a three-dimensional, you know, reality within a larger 10 or 11 dimensional reality. So we're part of God in that model, but it's hard to imagine we're God. We're not the fullness of God, which is something you believe. Yep. When you say God is external, you mean we aren't the fullness of God. And I don't disagree with you on that. It's just hard to, it's hard to reconcile our perspectives. So if you believe that we are not the fullness of God, I don't, I don't know that I guess the the dimension thing does make sense in that context. It's complicated. It is complicated. <clears throat> but I'm going to I'm going to do this Michio Kaku episode. And if you have a chance to listen to it, you should uh, let me know what you think. I, I have a guy on Twitter named Matt that recommended I look into zero point energy. So it's sort of his his doing that I that I got into this. But uh, it's pretty interesting. I like talking about physics, but it's way over my head, man. I, I know that there are people that will listen to it that that don't know as much about physics as I've picked up um, doing this podcast. And maybe they think, you know, there's something to that, but then know that there are lots of other people that are, you know, either arrogant or know a lot more about physics than I do that will laugh probably at the things that I'll say. Fuck them. Fuck them. Yeah. So, uh, don't have much time left. Mm -mm. Got anything else? I mean, I definitely have other things. Um, well, you remember the the Chinese balloon. 
Yeah. Have you seen any more of these like UFOs? I, yeah, I, would, I did want to talk to you about this. So it there's been there, there was the one they shot down. Has there been more since there was the balloon and then there was this object they shot down? Has there been more since then? Two more. And they shot them down? Or not? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think all of them have been taken down. But on online, the information that's being put about put out, like the balloon was a balloon. And we, you know, speculate that it's from China and it's got, you know, it looks like a satellite. It's got like um, observational capabilities, yeah. you know. Uh, the other things that they've been talking about, they're not putting much information out. It seems to me like they're trying to make people think that it's aliens. You know, um, I, well, I, t I definitely thought that. Yeah, because they said it, because they said it was unidentified. And when you use that word, you're, yeah. you're going to kind of make that connection. It's unidentified and it's flying and it's an object. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, um, yeah, I, I'm just super skeptical of it. I, I my immediate reaction to most things that's being put out is this is probably bullshit. Yeah. So here's what's strange to me is that they continue to call them unidentified, but a pilot shot it out of the sky. Mm -hmm. So at least the pilot knows what it was. The pilot can, can tell us information, but they're, they're not releasing that. Yeah. It's unidentified. We don't, it's about the size of a car, they said. You know what's internet? Yeah, yeah. About the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, they, that's it. So I heard that they're all round about the same size, but they are different like shapes. Mm. Um. Whatever the fuck that means. So you think you think this is likely um, to just trying to distract away from the balloon story, or do you think that there's? I don't know, man. I think. Do you think there was actually something shot down? It's a good question. I. So if it's a UFO, if it's a legitimate craft from an. Uh, an alien civilization that has the technology to come here. Mm -hmm. We are not shooting that down. Probably shouldn't. No, no, no. We don't have the capabilities oh, yeah. to shoot that down. That thing is going like to pick the fastest earth jet you can find. If that thing can get here from somewhere else, it's going to smoke the fastest That's jet true. that we have. Yeah, yeah. You can shoot a missile at it. It's going to outrun the missile. Most likely it, it can probably disappear and appear somewhere else. I mean, you know, who, who knows? This is science fiction at this point. Um, but I think that I'm inclined to believe that it's bullshit because it's either some kind of earth creation, like a government creation, some state new technology. Um, but I, I think it's like, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's completely fake. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's some, you know, this is like crazy conspiracy land again, but like, look at the things that have happened over the last three years i mean we've had a virus that was nothing that we acted like was the end of the fucking world uh we've got a like a minor dispute between on the world scale a minor dispute between two like backwoods eastern european countries that shouldn't have anything to fucking do with us that we're turning into world war three yeah um i just think that they are hungry for things you know events that they can capitalize on and mm. i think ronald reagan said something uh, to the effect of the entire world is going to come together when there's an alien threat i don't even fucking believe in aliens at this point um but i i do i think that that there's something to that like you know the aliens come and we're all gonna lose our shit and let them start doing whatever they want mm. Um, so I, I worry about that. Like, I think that's a, a legit possibility. Yeah, that's scary. I mean, I, my mind, my mind wonders if having like being in the middle of some kind of important conflict is the, is the least appropriate time to change presidents. You know, like if we're in, if we're embroiled and we're in the middle of something serious that Biden, mm. that Biden has been working on for four years, is America likely going to re replace him or are they going to let him finish you know, the job. Are we going to replace him with someone who knows nothing about it, especially somebody as volatile as a Donald Trump? So is is it something like that, like strategy aimed at trying to keep voters to, to you know, to stick with Biden? Maybe. I do think it's interesting that that Chinese balloon, they let literally float all the way across the country. Yeah. Uh, and the, these things, they're like shooting down over Montana and Alaska and Canada. I mean, it's like, why? Why are you shooting this thing down? It's a huge threat 
to shoot down that balloon. Yep. But the, these things you're shooting down. Yeah. The, the excuse they gave for that was that the balloon was high enough that it wasn't in um, commercial airspace, so it wasn't it wasn't a risk that it might run into an airplane or or hurt somebody. No, it's just taking pictures of our military bases, and yeah. you know, no big deal. It, it's also interesting that these other objects that they've seen after the balloon came from the same direction as the balloon. It came down through the Yukon, down through Alaska into Canada, down yeah. down into the Western United States. Um, that's kind of strange. So may, maybe, you know, maybe there's like drones or something. Maybe there's sophisticated drones. <clears throat> I don't know how what what the distance capabilities are like for a drone. Do you think you could, you think you could send a drone by remote control from China to Alaska? I think Alaska? you probably can. Yeah. I mean, I know that we we do it. You know, we bomb places via drone, and from what I understand, a lot of them are operating out of Arizona. Oh shit! Yeah. So yeah. So I guess maybe like with satellites and stuff, you can kind of do pretty much anything. Satellites, aka balloons. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard somebody say that that balloon thing, that there's tons of them up there, even if they're not actually satellites. Um, that there's tons of them up there, and normally they're so high that you can't see them. And he suspects that it was just like leaking helium, so that it, it just mm. drifted down. You know. Yep. Caught ya. Yep. Yep. Busted. Yeah, man, it's worrisome. Let's, I hope that I uh, hope that the cooler heads prevail in terms of the United States and China relationship and the Russia Ukraine relationship. I hope that uh, I hope that resolves. You know, wait, R Russia and <laughs> just our relationship with Russia. I yeah, mean, just the like, conflict in general, and yeah. this this whole thing has the potential of you know becoming like you know I don't know if you've seen any of the response from the Chinese, but the, the probably Propaganda machine in China is, makes it out like the United States is um, trying to create, uh, you know, a reason to, you know, to have a conflict with China. You know, what's sad is I know China is the big, bad, you know, big, bad boogeyman in the world for like most conservative type people. Um, but if China came out and said, this is America trying to make it look like us so that they have reasons to start shit with us, that would not surprise me at all if that was the truth. That's as sad as that is, the fact that I'm, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. That sounds exactly like something the CIA would do. Yeah, man. I know what you mean. Why? What, what are you? What you seem like? Uh, no, it's it's not laughing at the idea. It's laughing at the. Um, I was going to say the CIA does that. Shit. No, no. It's just laughing at the. The. I don't know what word to use, man. Um, it's funny because it's true kind of a thing. Okay. It's it's funny because I can't write it off and it's so terrible, but it's possible. And that's why I'm laughing. Yeah, I See, I thought you were laughing at the theory and I was like, dude. No, no. Like anybody who doesn't know, go research the things, one the things that the CIA has done. It will blow your fucking mind. Do you think that I know we're over time now, but do you think this um, committee that they're that they're doing to, about the weaponizing of the uh, federal government? Have you heard about this? Yeah, I, vaguely. Now, now that the Republicans have uh, control of the House, they're trying to push this, where they're going to investigate the role of the FBI and the CIA in manipulating social media coverage during the elections and uh, you know, uh, during the Hunter Biden scandal thing and the Russia gate and all that stuff they're they're going to be digging into that and trying to bring to light that the federal government were putting pressure on private businesses um, to sway public opinion and to control the media narrative in ways that were completely unfair and criminal. Um, yep. I don't know if anything will come of that, but I'm skeptical that anything will, but one of the things I heard is that there's evidence that it, it wasn't just the FBI that there were, there was a, like an abbreviation, one of those synonyms, uh, not synonyms, was, what is the word I'm looking for? I don't know what you're saying. The letters that are short for something bigger. What's that word? Oh, uh, <laughs> like right. NASA? Yeah, like NASA. Yeah, I can't, uh, I don't know. But... There was one of those, one of those things that is called like, uh, I've lost it, but, there, but it doesn't directly say CIA, but it says that they're, that they're interest from other government organizations mm. the implication was it was the cia so now and the cia is supposed to be um th their purview is supposed to be um 
outside of our country. They're not supposed to be worried about, you know, it, uh, t like terrorist groups in the United States. They're supposed to be worried about, you know, intelligence external. external. Yeah. And so th if they were like the FBI um, manipulating things on the home front, that not only is that um, a much larger problem than when we thought it was just the FBI, but now th there might be evidence that the CIA is basically overreaching their power, like they're doing things that they're not supposed to be doing at all. And that, that could be a much more damning and a much bigger concern. So I have no idea. Uh, I think that there's an, enough powerful people involved that it's it's likely if anybody takes the fall for this, it's going to be not the right people, not, the, not yeah. the people that it should, should be taking the fall for this. I mean, I just think that like you, you got a group of people and you say, hey, I need you guys to investigate yourselves, you know? Yes. Like I don't fucking, it's yeah. not, nothing's going to come up. It's Even like, though these guys have the red ties and these guys have the blue ties, there's nobody in Congress, in Senate, in the White House. There's nobody in government at the moment who I believe is working counter to the establishment. They're all just a fucking part of it, or they want to be a part of it. Yep, that reminds me of uh, the the talk that we we hear from time to time about term limits, mm. and even about like when the uh, when when Congress votes for their own raises because that's how it works. It's like Congress is never going to vote for term limits. They're never going to vote for reducing congressional compensation. They're never, because they're the ones that have to say, and it directly affects them, either by reducing their power or reducing their, you know, money. So you're going to ask those people to vote for term limits. They're never, never going to vote for term limits. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't know how I feel about term limits. Um, sometimes I think that like, like Nancy Pelosi, you know, who's obviously made a shit ton of money off of the information that she's had from her position. Um, if you give them a term limit, do they just like ramp it up? They're like, I got to get it in. You know, I've got four years. I need to get it in. Yeah. But, you know, maybe, but it seems like if they had to get it in in four years, that there, that there would be more, more possibility for them to the wind. Yeah. yeah. People would notice, you know, it's like, Wait a minute, Nancy Pelosi served only one term, and she's and she, a bajillionaire. Yeah, now? she she has a you know, hundred and fifty percent rate of return on her investments. Yeah, something's not right. Yeah, so True. I don't know. I also don't know about term limits because I don't know that I think that kings should have term limits, and I'm like becoming a monarchist more and more every day. That's a scary thing to hear. Yeah. Um, I guess we can dig into that on the next episode of the Two Dugs Podcast. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, uh, Kyle wants to bring back King George, apparently. Mm, I don't know about King George. King Kyle? Ooh, definitely not. <laughs> that's, a, that's a terrifying <laughs> thought. All right, guys. Until we meet again. Adios. Well, there you have it.